Economic growth is important to each country's well-being and standard of living. Depending on the country's economic standing in the world, the question being asked may be different. A high-income country like the U.S., Germany, or Japan may ask, how can economic growth continue to help us maintain our high standard of living? Middle-income countries like South Korea, Brazil, or India ask if they can continue their relatively high growth rates and eventually catch up to the high-income countries. Low-income countries like Afghanistan, Peru, and then Zimbabwe ask if economic growth can lift them out of poverty. One of the measures related to a country's standard of living impacted by economic growth is diet. The quantity and types of foods consumed determine the overall calorie intake of, intake of a country and its citizens. Not only has the number of calories consumed per day increased in most countries, so has the amount of food calories that people are able to afford based on their working wages. Historically, economic growth has been supported by certain societal con constructs. The most important is the rule of law. That is to say, the common consent to live by certain laws and consequences for breaking the law. Specifically, law that, that, protected, uh, that protect individual and contractual rights have been the most effective to promote and sustain economic growth. Other facets of a society that act as supporting pillars to, uh, to sustain economic growth are uh, moral standards that help prevent stealing, murdering, and other infringements to an individual's rights, individual responsibility, encouraging citizens to work and provide for their own welfare, private property ownership, allowing for a free economy to operate, free trade, which allows for the benefits of specialization and a free market economy, and finally, limited government, which allows the government the right to protect the individual's rights and avoids the faults of a command economic system. A production function is the process of turning economic inputs like labor, machinery, and raw materials into outputs like goods and services used by consumers. An aggregate production function shows what goes into producing the output for an overall economy. This aggregate production function has GDP as its output. This aggregate production function has GDP per capita as its output because it is calculated on a per person basis. The labor input is already figured into the other factors and does not need to be listed separately. Output per, per hour worked is a measure of worker productivity. In the US economy, worker productivity rose more quickly in the 1960s and the mid uh, 1990s compared with the 1970s and the 1980s. However, uh, the, th these growth, growth rate differences are only a few percentage points per year. Look carefully to see them in the changing slope uh, of the line. The average U.S. worker produced nearly $150 per hour in 2012. U.S. growth in worker productivity is very was very high between 1950 and 1970. It then declined to a lower lower levels in 1970s and the 80s. The late 1990s and early 2000s saw productivity rebound, but then productivity sagged a bit in the 2000s. Some think that uh, product the productivity rebound of the late 1990s and early 2000s marks a, new, a start of a new economy built on higher productivity growth, but this cannot be determined until more time has passed. Rising levels of education for persons 25 and older show the deepening of human capital in the U.S. economy. Even today, relatively few U.S. adults have completed a four-year college degree. 
there is clearly room for additional deepening of human capital to occur. The value of the physical capital measured by plant and equipment used by the average worker in the U.S. economy has risen over the decades. The increase may have leveled off a bit in the 1970s and 1980s, which were not coincidentally times of slower, uh, of slower than usual growth in worker productivity. We see a renewed increase in physical capital per worker in the late 1990s, followed by a flattening in the early 2000s. Here are three reasons, or three lessons, here are three lessons regarding economic growth. Uh, lesson number one, technology is typically the most important contributor to growth, especially in mature high income economies. Uh, lesson number two, physical capital and human capital have equal importance to each other. One without the other is, is less effective. And then lesson number three is all three factors must work together. Imagine that the economy starts at point R. With the level of physical and human capital C1 and the output per capita at G1. If the economy relies only on capital deepening while remaining at the techno technology level shown by the technology one line, then it would face diminishing marginal returns as it moved from point R to point U to point W. However, now imagine that capital deepening is combined with improvements in technology. Then, as capital deepens from C1 to C2, technology improves from technology 1 line to technology 2 line. The economy moves from R to S. Similarly, as capital deepens from C2 to C3, technology increases from technology 2 to technology 3 and the economy moves from S to T. With improvements in technology, there is no longer any reason that economic growth must necessarily slow down. Hence, the impact of the law of diminishing returns can be avoided with the use of technology in the form of invention and innovation. 